Good morning, church family. It's, I would say it's good to see you all, but it's, there's so many lights right now, I can't, I can see silhouettes, but it's great to be with you to worship today. And let's stand up in the presence of the Lord. The Bible says, come before his presence with singing. It says, stand up and bless the Lord your God from everlasting to everlasting. Amen. Amen. Hallelujah. Lord, we bless your name this morning. And Holy Spirit, we invite you into this place. We welcome your presence, God. We know, Father, that Psalms 22, 3 says that you are enthroned in our praise. So look, we look forward to encountering you, Lord, today. Hallelujah. You are good. You love and yours forever. Hallelujah. Seeking your face, yes, Lord. It's you that we long for. It's you that we need. Come, Lord. So come, Holy Spirit. We need you to. this healing in your name so open up the heavens oh and pour out your healing ray as we set our hearts to praise you to love and seek your face so come now holy spirit oh and let your presence Set our hearts 
on, give the Lord praise today. Lord, we worship you. We praise you. Hallelujah. 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 Hallelujah.
2011 Arab Spring I was deployed on a destroyer in the East Mediterranean and my wife was going into labor with our first boy was that tough I get I get uh, match chief the command match chief banging on my door he's like your son is coming now so I'm excited but I'm also praying because you know first one right 30 hours of labor later all the moms are like oh 30 hours of labor later, the baby is in distress and is not coming. They had to do an emergency C-section. And I am on the other side of the world and can do nothing. I can do nothing. But this song, while I was there in the middle of nowhere, I prayed this song, that you are holy. I could do nothing, but he could do everything. Amen. As he was sharing this this morning for the worship team, all of a sudden God showed me, you know, he wants, he wants to birth something new. He wants anything that's been held back. You know, there's life in his, in his presence. There's life in the spirit. He's the father of life. He's the life force and he's the life source. There's no life outside of God. Amen. So if that's you today, if you've had dreams that have been held back, if you've been praying for a loved one, they've been suffering from addiction, they've been suffering from disease, if that's, if that's your finances, if that's your marriage, I want you to grab a hold of this this morning.
awestruck wonder at the mention of your name. I'm filled with wonder, awestruck wonder at the mention of With wonder, awestruck wonder at the mention of your name. Jesus, your name is power.
is Palm Sunday. It's the day that we remember that Jesus rode into Jerusalem. The crowds around him began to worship. Hosanna, save us. Lord, save us. Deliver us. 
You are the answer to what I have been hoping for. And one of, one of the things that they did is that they laid down their, their robes. They laid down their palms down before the road so that the Lord could come in. That fundamental to worship. Fundamental to allowing the King of Kings to enter in is us laying our lives down. In fact, it says in the book of Revelation that we lay our crowns down before the Lord. Why? Because he is the only one who is worthy. I'm going to invite us to come back and sing this song again. And I believe it's appropriate this morning that we would come and we would come into a, a posture of worship, into a place of reverence before the Lord, of laying our own lives down before the King of kings and the Lord of lords. In the same way that that 2,000 years ago, they laid down th their robes. Their, literally, their robes would represent their authority, the, the mantle, like, like a uniform would. They would lay that down before the Lord so that the king could enter in. The elders around the throne take down their authority and they say, Lord, it's, it's yours. And this morning, for those who are able in this room, that we would come to a place of, of, of humility, of laying our own lives down, of saying, Lord, I'm laying down my own authority. I'm, ba I'm choosing to lay down the mantle of my authority so that you can come in. I'm choosing to take off my crown, the symbol of my own power, my own authority. I'm choosing to, in our culture, it's choosing to bend our knee and say, Lord, everything of who I am is in submission to the King of kings and the Lord of lords. So I will lay my crowns down at your feet. You are holy, holy, and I give my life as an offering. You are worthy, so worthy, and I my crowns down at your feet. You are holy, holy, and I will give my life as an offering. You are worthy, worthy. Lord, your word calls us to allow our lives to be a living sacrifice. Lord, the message of Palm Sunday is that the king can't enter unless we lay down our authority before him. Lord, you came in peace and you ask for the door to be opened. You don't break it down. And so, Lord, in submission and in humility before you, we would say, Lord, the doors of our heart are open before you. And, Lord, as the psalmist would say, Lord, may the King of glory enter in. May the King of glory enter in. If that's your prayer this morning, would you just, in your own words, pray that before the Lord? saying, Lord, I'm coming to you humbly. And I'm asking that all of who you are, I open up my heart to. Everything of who I am. Lord, I open up the gates of my heart to the King of glory. Just in your own words, would you just pray that prayer before the Lord? Holy, holy, holy is the Lamb upon the throne. We'll join with all of heaven in the everlasting song. And holy, holy, holy is the Lamb upon the throne. We'll join with all of heaven in the everlasting song. 
And holy, holy, holy is the Lamb upon the throne. We'll join with all of heaven in the everlasting song. And holy, holy, holy is the Lamb upon the throne. We'll join with all of heaven in the everlasting song. So I will lay my crowns down at your feet. You are worthy, so worthy, and I will give my life as an offering. You are worthy, so worthy, God. You may be here today. Even as Pastor Brent was sharing a word during worship about new beginnings. New beginnings happen when we allow the King to enter in. You may be here today and you would say, Pastor, I've never opened up my heart to the love of Jesus Christ. I've never bowed my knee before the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords. If that's you this morning, even as we're here in worship right now, would you just pray that prayer with me that today, today is a new beginning. You may be here today and say, I've walked with the Lord a long time, but there's places in my life that I have not yielded, I have not surrendered, I have not bowed my knee before the King. Today is a new beginning for you. Today is the day of new beginnings, and it's a new beginning because the King is in the room. It's a new beginning because we allow that King to come and make all things new. In fact, that's one of the things that Jesus says, I've come to make all things new. He is a God of new beginnings. And the new beginnings happen when we come and we bow our knee before the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords. If that's your prayer this morning, there's two prayers that we're going to pray. The first prayer is this, that you've never opened up your heart to the love of Jesus Christ. You've never bowed your knee before the King of kings and the Lord of lords, and you recognize the reality that all of us are sinners and we all need a Savior, and his name is Jesus. If that's you today, I'm going to ask that you would pray this prayer with me, and in fact, I'm going to ask every one of us to pray this prayer. Would you just repeat after me? Dear Jesus, I come and I open my heart to you. I come and I open my life to you. I recognize that you are my Savior and you are the one that forgives me of my sin. Today, would you come and make all things new? In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. There's some of us in this room, there, there's areas in our life that need to be brought into a place of it's really submission, obedience to the Lord. You know the Lord. You know his heart. You know his word. But there's areas in your life that you know are outside of how he has called you to live. Today, the Lord comes to make those areas new. Make all things new. And I want to encourage you today, if that's you, if that's you, to allow your heart to yield to the Lord. And I want you to see this picture. You, you understand that like in MMA or in, 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 in wrestling, there's this fighting that's going on and there comes a point where the dominant person gets the other person. It's in a submissive hold. And that person has to tap out or things are going to get broken, if you know what I mean. The reality of the gospel is that God has each one of us in a submissive hold. And that if, if we don't tap out, there's things that are broken. And they're not broken by God. They're broken by sin. And the Lord gives us a way out, but it happens because we choose to submit. We choose to yield. Worship is that yielding aspect in our, in our walk with the Lord. Where we say, Lord, this is yours. This addiction, I know it's wrong. I know it's bad. I know it's holding me back. It's yours. It's yours. 
This attitude, this lifestyle, it's yours. It's yours. I don't want this to define my life any longer. If that's you today, if that's you today, would you just lift your hand? And I want to just pray a prayer of freedom over you. Lord, you see the hands and you see the hearts that are open to you right now. And Lord, in the same way, Lord, we would pray a loosing of the power of sin and brokenness. And Lord, that because of repentance, we are set free by the power of the blood of Jesus Christ. So Lord, I pray freedom. Freedom as we come and yield our lives to the hand of God. And Lord, that there would be freedom that we would walk in and freedom that we would live in from this day forth. Lord, let this be a moment and let this be a day of new beginnings. And let those new beginnings begin in us today because we say yes to you. If that's your prayer, would you just say amen with me today? Amen. Amen. Well, praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. Let's just sing that chorus. I will lay my crowns down at your feet. You are holy, holy, and I will give my life as an offering. You are worthy, so worthy. Lord, you are worthy in this place. And because you are worthy, and you are the only one that is, you are the only one that is worthy of our worship. We worship and we honor you this morning. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Well, if you'd please have a seat, and as you do, would you turn to the person next to you and just say, I love being in the presence of the Lord. probably already had church this morning, <laughs> but as we come as we come this morning, uh, I want us to be able to uh, just respond to the word, and, and there's, a, there's an important word I, uh, this morning. In fact, I told Melissa that this is the first time this has ever happened to me. I dreamed the points of the sermon earlier this week. I don't know if I was stressed. I don't know if the Lord knew that I didn't have a lot of time. Uh, but he was like, okay, here's the sermon for Sunday. Here's your points. I was like, Lord, thank you. Could you do this every week? That would be fantastic. And so we're going to get to the word here in just a second. But before we do, this is, this is Holy Week. And Holy Week begins with Palm Sunday. It, uh, it concludes next, next Sunday with Easter. How many are happy that Easter is, is uh, a reality and we get to celebrate it? Amen. <laughs> As we come to our Easter celebration, we have some flyers, and I'm going to invite the ushers to pass them out right now. You got some of them as you walked, uh, as you walked in. Easter is a great opportunity to invite someone to church. How many know even just this last, th this last 20 minutes that we had in worship that there's people in your life that you know need to have an encounter with God like we just had? Invite them. Invite them not just to Easter. Invite them to church. How many know that the Lord is alive and that the Lord wants to touch our lives? How many would say amen to that? Amen. Well, if you believe it, bring somebody. Because the reality of the gospel is that it's for everybody and that we are to share the gospel. This week, would you invite someone that needs to be in church? Would you invite a neighbor, a, a, a child, a, a grandchild, someone in your life that needs to be in the house of the Lord? Invite an enemy. Invite your boss. Maybe they'll give you a raise, all right? So, uh, and then we have some fun stuff with, with Easter. We have an Easter egg hunt after service for, for the kids. Uh, the Easter egg hunt for adults, um, that's on you. You can go buy your own eggs and throw them around your backyard. Uh, but we have some fun stuff for the kids. It's, it's a great celebration Sunday. But ultimately, the thing that we are celebrating 
is the fact that we serve a living God. Amen and amen. And so also with our, with our uh, celebration this week, we have a Good Friday service, Friday, uh, Friday night, 7 o'clock. Easter doesn't happen without the cross. And we remember that, that Christ died for our sins. We'll receive communion together. It's a worship service. I would, I would encourage you, if you've never come to a Good Friday service, make that a priority. 7 o'clock Friday night. Everyone, everyone should be here at that service. It is the, it is the central, it's the, the, the focus of, of, our, of our worship is, is the cross. And the, and the resurrection. Well, and earlier that day, we had something called a crosswalk, and it's a really, um, really cool event if you would like to be a part of it. From 4.30 to 6.30, there's flyers, and Dee and Tom can tell you all about um, that event, and it's um, basically um, a place where you're able to uh, do the walk of Jesus, carrying the cross in a place of worship and celebrating the Lord for those things. Also, a couple, couple of other, other things. One, last week we had our first community group uh, and that was, we had five, five homes opened up, uh, opened up their house. Over, over 65 of you went to different homes throughout, throughout San Marcos and Escondido. We had a great time. And so you may say, I missed it. And you did. But the good news, the good news is we're going to have another one next month, April 21st. So mark your calendars. Uh, it's a great opportunity to connect with, uh, with other people in the church, build community. And another way that we build community is through our Emmaus Bible Institute. Um, many of you have been a part of our Emmaus program, and it is a Bible institute. It helps you grow deeper in not only your walk with the Lord, but in understanding the Word of God. So um, sign-ups are now for the next semester that are coming. Don't miss your opportunity. It's once, um, just one night a week. And so if you would like to be a part of that, please, um, you can get a flyer that's in the back or talk to um, Dr. Jody here in the front. Yeah. If you've ever thought, wow, Pastor Brian's sermons are so good, I just don't want them to stop. Well, then you'll enjoy Emmaus Bible Institute. You know, there you go. Uh, and so, um, also, uh, also, last year, uh, last year we, we took our first trip to Israel. It was a life-changing experience for myself, for the people that were on the trip. Um, we are going back this year. We are going back this year. If you are interested in that, in that trip, we will, we will, uh, it will be late September, early October. And part of the things that we, we do, this trip will be a little bit different in that we're going to be joining, uh, joining the Day of Prayer for the Peace of Jerusalem. Every year, every year there is a, 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 a Sunday that the Church of Jesus Christ sets aside to pray for the peace of Jerusalem. And when you say, why would we do that? Well, Scripture calls us to. That's uh, Psalms 122, verse 3, if I remember off the top of my head. But don't quote me, all right? But the Lord says, pray for the peace pray for the peace of Jerusalem. Not just this pray for the peace of the city that I've set you in. That's a different verse. But pray specifically for the peace of Jerusalem. We will be there and we will have hold that event the day before the anniversary of the October 7th attacks. And I think of anything, this is, this is a special moment in time for the church of Jesus Christ to rise up and say, we stand with God's people. We stand with the city that bears the name of God. And, uh, and that this tour will be, we'll see all the sites, we'll do all of the things. And it's, it's incredible. And we will be taking that specific prayer stance during our trip. It is going to be a, a life-changing opportunity. If you are interested in finding out more information, we'll be announcing it over the next couple of weeks. Fill out a sign-up sheet. Uh, there's an there interest form in the back. I'm saying that in faith, but there will be an interest form in the back. Well, as you can see, there's a lot happening here at Grace. So I want to make sure you understand this week, we're not having our midweek service or youth. Um, our service will be on Friday for this weekend and then, of course, on Sunday morning. And um, we would invite all of you to be able to join us for, a, for both of those events. Fi finally, two, two, more, two more things. Uh, if you are interested in helping, uh, helping one on the worship team, you, maybe, you have, maybe you play an instrument beautifully and you're just like, hide it under a bushel, yes, I'm not going to let that light shine, all right? Uh, I would encourage you to talk to, talk to, talk to Brent. We would, we're opening that up for, uh, for, for new members. Also, you may say, I would love to help produce the service with the sound, the video, the lyrics, all of that. You may, that may be an area of interest. We're looking to train some new people for that as well. If that's an area of interest, talk to, talk to Chris in the back. We would love to get you on the team. Finally, Finally, last one, maybe the most important one of all. It is someone's birthday today. 
and it is Pastor Tom. Pastor Tom, you are, you are <laughs> 70 ahead, stand years up. young. Uh, Tom is on our, our pastoral staff here, him and his wife, Dee. I'm sure most of you already know them. They do a lot of care for probably you and people in your life. And so we're so grateful to have you a part of our church here. But not only that, it's a place of honor and saying you made it not only to 70, but um, I would say, you know, you look great for being seven years old. We have a gift for you. If you want, come on up here. And um, if you want to just extend your hand a blessing on him, this 70 years, we ask for a fresh anointing of strength, of miracles, that as you would walk, that God would open up. I see him illuminating the paths ahead of you, that there would be a place of new life and a new birthing in you. In Jesus' name, amen. 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 Tom, we are thankful for you, and we're thankful for Dee and your son and your whole family this year. So, yes. If you've ever wanted to meet the whole criminal clan, today's the day. They're right down there. <laughs> And so, um, ushers, if you want to come forward, we're going to worship the Lord with our tithes and offerings today. And as we do, let's pray. Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you that we can come and worship you with the gifts that you place in our hands. Lord, we honor you today. In Jesus' name, amen. The ushers are going to walk the buckets through the room. You can give online at gracesanmarcos.net. You can also give uh, through our app, our Grace San Marcos app in the App Store. And uh, that's a great way also to get the sermon notes for this Sunday, uh, which we're going to be using. And then, David, could you hand me my iPad right there? And after, uh, as soon as the, as the ushers are done receiving the offering, we have uh, this morning, we have the scriptures. Uh, I printed them out for you. Uh, this is, this is uh, Palm Sunday. And with it being Palm Sunday, this is, a, this is an account that happens in all four of the Gospels. The story of, of Jesus riding into Jerusalem. And, and so what I did is I, I looked at all four of the, four of the Gospels and I compiled the, the, the whole story. Each, each Gospel kind of tells their, their own view of it. There's, they all tell the same story. There's little, there's little differences in each one of them. So we compiled it all together so that we can see the whole story. We're going to read that together. But one of the things before we jump into our, our message today, and really our message this morning is, is a continuation of what we were talking about during worship, that Palm Sunday is, this, is the day where Jesus rode into Jerusalem. He rode into Jerusalem not as a conquering king, but he rode into Jerusalem as a lamb that was to be slain. And through that sacrifice, is, is what we remember this week, and through that sacrifice is, is where our salvation is, comes from. One of the things that, from a contextual standpoint, as we, as we will read the Palm Sunday account, is that Palm Sunday happens right on the heels of another famous story in the scriptures. And in John chapter 11 is the story of Lazarus. Lazarus uh, was a, a, a man, he was, he was a follower of Christ. He wasn't one of the, the 12 disciples, but he would have been in that group of people that was following after Jesus. Lazarus dies and he is resurrected. Jesus raises him to life. And it's on the heels of that resurrection that we see Palm Sunday. In fact, the Gospel of John talks about that one of the reasons there were so, the, the crowd in, in Jerusalem was so big on this day as Jesus is coming in is because they had heard about the resurrection that had taken place of Lazarus. It's also important just for our own contextual minds, as, as reading the story of Scripture and reading the account as we will uh, on Good Friday, reading the account of the cross that it was just a brief period before that the disciples had seen with their own eyes a resurrection take place. And it's at the resurrection of Lazarus where Jesus says, I am the resurrection and the life. And so the, the resurrection of Jesus, he's giving them the appetizer. He's letting them know that this is going to be happening. He's allowing there to be seeds of faith to be placed in their hearts for the, the event that is going to take place. How many know that there's times that the Lord prepares us for with, with, with pictures, with, with, with little minor miracles, all right, if we can say that. Can we say minor miracles in church? I don't know if we can. But he prepares us with smaller miracles because there's bigger things that are taking place. And those stories and those testimonies exist and those testimonies build our faith. 
They build our faith. And even this, uh, even this morning, I want to just share of, of three testimonies that, that, had, uh, that, that came across, uh, that, that had been shared with me just in the last two weeks. The first, the first was, was Mike right down here in the, in the front row. Mike had, a, had an accident, went to, went to the hospital, x-rays, fractures all up and down his back. Accurate? Yep. And he had to come back into the doctor a couple days later. We prayed, we prayed for him, laid hands on him like scripture says. He comes back in, gets a second round of x-rays, no fractures in his back. Complete, completely healed. On, th- on Thursday night, one of, one of the guys uh, that come, uh, comes on Thursday night, Matt, uh, Matt or Matthew, shared, shared a story of praying for his, his mom. His mom has been diagnosed with stage four cancer, lives on the East Coast. Been praying for, him, uh, for her for a period of, of, of weeks. We've been praying for her. She got a report today. Her cancer is in full remission, and she has a full recovery with zero, with zero <laughs> prognosis on the front end. So he gave testimony of that. How many know that we overcome by the blood of the lamb and the word of our testimony? That there's a place that when we give testimony and giving testimony isn't just remembering what God has done, but literally that word in the Greek is prophesying that he will do it again. That's what, that's what testimony is. And so as, as we celebrated with Matt, and, uh, and that was a, a, an incredible testimony, Moses, who was in, in service, says, well, you guys were praying for me, in, for my arm. I had to get surgery on it this week. I went in, was on the operating table, and the doctor says, there's nothing wrong with your arm. Whatever the problem was, is gone. And no, sur- no surgery was needed. Why do we give testimony? Those testimonies are to build our faith. To build our faith because what God has done, he will do again. And what has God has done in the physical, he can do in the spiritual. He can do not just in the spiritual, he can do in our relationships. He can do in, our, in every area of our life. The gospel is holistic. That's what Luke chapter 4 says. When Jesus says, this is what I came to do. Luke chapter 4, I came to heal the brokenhearted, recovery of sight to the blind, freedom to the oppressed, and today this is fulfilled in your hearing. In those three things, recovery of sight to the blind, healing to the brokenhearted, uh, uh, freedom to the oppressed, the preaching of the good news, that's a holistic picture that we are body, we are soul, and we are spirit, and the gospel comes to transform all three areas of our life. And so as we, as we open up the scriptures today and we see this, the, the, the story of Palm Sunday, it's the picture of what God will do and wants to do in our lives. We've been talking about Nehemiah and, and how Nehemiah is, is a picture of, of a holistic restoration. The, the rebuilding of Jerusalem, the, the story that's told in the books of Ezra and Nehemiah, the, the rebuilding of Jerusalem happens first with the building of the temple. Getting, getting that soul place right in our lives. That place that says that, that my, my heart belongs to the Lord. It's, it's what we would call getting saved. But there has to be more rebuilding that happens in the city of Jerusalem. And Nehemiah comes to rebuild the walls. And some of us in our lives have a situation where we've come to a place of faith, but the rest of our lives is, as the Hebrew would say, an absolute dumpster fire. All right? And so... You didn't know it said that in Hebrew, but it does somewhere. You just have to look hard enough and squint your eyes, all right? And Nehemiah, Nehemiah in the Hebrew, his name means comforter. And in the same way that the Lord sends the Holy Spirit to rebuild, uh, the same way that the Lord sent Nehemiah to rebuild the walls of Jerusalem, he sends the Holy Spirit to rebuild our own lives. And with that, With that, we see that holistic picture of the gospel, that it starts with the temple, it starts with our worship, and it comes out to that outer portion of now, what does the rest of my life look like? How can God rebuild that? And the promise of the gospel, Luke chapter 4, is Jesus says, I've come to heal your bodies. I've come to heal your spirit. I've come to heal the brokenhearted, to freedom to the oppressed, liberty to the captives. And here's the best part, today, this is fulfilled. Today, this is available to you. This isn't a promise for tomorrow. This is a promise for right now. And the picture of of Palm Sunday is that the King of Kings stands outside the gates of your life, stands outside the gates of your heart. And the question is, are we going to allow him in? 
Are we going to allow him in? Are we going to allow him to step through? And he's not going to knock down the gates. He's not going to tear down the walls. He's going to ask to be invited in. And that's the place of surrender. That's the place of worship. That's what we were talking about as we came and we're bowing before the Lord. That's not just a, a, a physical act. It's, it's a spiritual act of saying, Lord, I am, I am bowing my will to the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords. And so that's our, that's our preamble for the scripture uh, reading today. Uh, I had the, uh, the ushers pass out, pass out the reading. This is, great, this is a great study even for, for this week as we kind of compiled uh, the scripture today. We're going to read it. It's going to be on the screen. It's also on the app if you want to follow along. And we're just going to read the text. You see the references before you. The next day, a great multitude had come to the feast when they had heard that Jesus was coming to Jerusalem. Now that when they had drew near to Jerusalem and came to Bethpage at the Mount of Olives, then Jesus sent two disciples, saying to them, Go into the village opposite you, and immediately you will find a donkey tied and a colt with her. Loose them, bring them to me. And if anyone says anything to you, you shall say, The Lord has need of them, and immediately he will send them. So they went their way, and they found a colt tied by the door outside the street, and they loosed it. But some of those who stood there said to them, what are you doing, loosing the colt? And they spoke to them just as Jesus had commanded, so they let them go. All this was done that it might be fulfilled, which was spoken by the prophet, saying, tell the daughter of Zion, fear not, behold, your king is coming to you, lowly, sitting on a donkey, a colt, the fowl of a donkey. So the disciples went and did as Jesus commanded him. His disciples did not understand these things at first, but when Jesus was glorified, then they remembered that these things were written about him and that they had done these things to him. They brought the donkey and the colt and laid their clothes on him and set, and, and set him on them. And a great multitude spread their clothes on the road and others cut down branches from the trees and spread, spread them on the road. Then the multitude who went before them and those who followed cried out, saying, Hosanna to the Son of David. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Hosanna in the highest. Blessed is the kingdom of our father David that comes in the name of the Lord. Hosanna in the highest. Blessed is the king who comes in the name of the Lord. Peace in heaven and glory in the highest. Hosanna. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord, the king of Israel. And when he had come into Jerusalem, all the city was moved, saying, Who is this? And so the multitude says, This is Jesus, the prophet from Nazareth of Galilee. And some of the Pharisees called to him from the crowd, Teacher, rebuke your disciples. But he answered and said to them, I tell you that if these should keep silent, the stones would immediately cry out. And the Pharisees therefore said among themselves, You see that you are accomplishing nothing. Look, the world has gone after him. This is the story of, this is the, the, the account of, of Palm Sunday from all four Gospels. And as we, we look at this passage, I want to talk about worship that allows the king to enter in. Worship that makes room for the king. Or worship that makes way for a king. All right, I don't know what the title, the title is. That's the correct one. So worship that makes way for a king. The reality of our lives is that our lives are built around worship. In that same picture of, of, of rebuilding the city of Jerusalem from Nehemiah, the center, the heartbeat of the city is where the temple is built. The heartbeat of our lives is what we worship. And we can choose to worship the living God or we can choose to worship something else. But regardless, the center of our lives will be what we worship. As believers, as disciples of Jesus Christ, the center is our worship. And so when we come to Palm Sunday, this is, this, is, this is talking about what happens when we allow the King of Kings to be center stage, the epicenter of our lives. Uh, Jesus talks about it in, in the Gospels that the, the, the Lord is the rock in which we build our lives on. And I, before we get into the three points, because there's three aspects of worship that we see in the passages that we just read. But before we, before we get there, I want to recognize that you notice at the end of the story, there were voices talking about that our worship should, should stay silent, right? You remember that? 
It's right here. It's right here when it says, and Gavin Newsom told the churches they can't sing. I think that's where, uh, that, is that, is that, I, I don't know. I don't, that may be the, that must be like the New Living Translation, right? But we see at the end of the story, the Pharisees tell the disciples to be quiet. And what's, what's, what's Jesus' response? Jesus' response to that was, if they're quiet, all of creation itself will cry out. Meaning that the Lord will be praised. The Lord will be praised. And the question is, who will praise him? And I, I am determined that I am not going to be outworshipped by a pile of rocks, all right? And so there's this place where, there's this place where we are, and, and ironically, Scripture says we are living stones. There is a place where the hardness of our own lives cries out to the Lord. We are living stones, and as living stones, this is Second Peter chapter 2, as living stones, we cry out to the Lord. So there's this place of worship. And so the Pharisees say that the, the disciples need to be quiet. And you hear this criticism. And, and in our culture, whenever we hear criticism, we think, oh, you know, we don't want to be offensive to anyone. We don't want to hurt anyone's feelings because we're nice people. I mean... I mean, you guys are nice. I'm, I'm not particularly nice, but you guys are wonderful people. And we don't want to be offensive. We don't want to hurt anyone's feelings. But recognize that they are critiquing, they are asking the disciples to be quiet, knowing that it's futile, knowing that it's, it, it, it's pointless. This is in the book of John, uh, chapter 12. They said, they said to them among themselves, you see, we are accomplishing nothing. We're accomplishing nothing. And even though they're accomplishing nothing, they still want the disciples to be quiet. Recognize that in our culture, when there are the voices that say the church should be quiet, one, they are accomplishing nothing, and two, it doesn't mean that they're going to stop saying it. Because the reality of the gospel, again, 2 Peter. 2 Peter comes, and we've been in that passage for the past couple of uh, months, been referring back to it. To those who believe our Savior is beautiful. To those who believe, he is precious. But to those who do not believe, he is a rock of offense. And the reality of the culture that we live in is that when, there's, when there is, the, 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 the story and the truth of the gospel will be offensive to people who don't believe. And that has nothing to do with you and everything to do with him. And so with that, don't allow your worship to be quiet in the face, in the face of the voices around you that say, mm, "You're a little," it's a little too loud. It's a little too loud. God has created us to be worshipers, and He has created us to live a life of worship. Can we say Amen to that? Amen. So that was that was like a little bonus, a little bonus for the the service, uh, the message today, um, like a little appetizer. We've had a lot of appetizers today, but hopefully we're not too full for the whole uh, rest of the meal. So worship that makes way for a king. There's three aspects to worship that we see in this passage. There's three aspects of worship that we see in the story of Palm Sunday. The first aspect of worship is this, say yes. Say yes. And with that, what, what, what does that mean? The first aspect that we see is, is kind of this curious start to the story where Jesus says, hey, to his disciples, hey, go over to this house Take their donkey, bring it over to me. And, you know, it, it would be like if I said, hey, you know, uh, why don't you go over to the neighbors, you know, Barham Villas right down there. Just take, just take, just take room 32. Just take, their, just take their car, bring it over. And if anyone asks, just say, hey, the Lord has need of it. All right. And so that's basically what Jesus asks, uh, asks them to do. And, and with that, we see, you see the, the, story, uh, the story of that, that Jesus rides in on this, this donkey. And the first aspect of worship is this place of saying yes to what the Lord asks us to do. Saying yes. How, and so then the question with that is, how do we say yes to the Lord? Worship is fundamentally, fundamentally worship is saying yes to the Lord. Lord, I recognize that you are king and I am not. And I come in, in worship to you. How do we say yes to the Lord? And in this passage, we see three things. The first is, we see the, the, the first thing Jesus asked them to do is go to that donkey, go to that colt, and untie it. Untie it. And if we are to allow our lives to be used unto the glory of the Lord, there has to be a place where we are untying ourselves from the things that would hold us back. 
It's not that Jesus told the disciples, hey, command, command, command that donkey to be set free. No, just go in and untie it. In our life, there's things that hold us back. There's sin that holds us back. There's addiction that holds us back. There's mindsets that hold us back. Some of those things you need to be prayed and set freed from. Others of those things you just need to untie. You just need to untie. I mean, I think it says in the Hebrew, just stop doing the, the dumb stuff, all right? And there's this place where we untie ourselves so that we can allow our lives to be used for the glory of the Lord. This is the promise, Luke chapter four. This is the promise of the Lord. He came to set you free. He came to, set, to give freedom to the oppressed and freedom to the prisoner. The oppressed are people that have had things done to them. The prisoners, they've done things to themselves. Both he's come to set free. So whether you find yourself tied up because of something that someone has done to you or something that you, your own mistakes, the promise of the gospel is that there is freedom for both of you. And the first step in saying yes to the Lord is saying, I'm untying myself from the things that are holding me back. The second place that we see, we see this, this promise of scripture of how do we say yes? This is the question. How do we say yes to the Lord is that bring it to me. Untie the donkey and bring it to me. There's this place where we don't just untie, we just don't untie ourselves from the things that are holding us back, but then there's the action of taking that and bringing it before the Lord. And the Lord comes, there's this beautiful exchange that scripture promises that he comes, he brings, he gives us beauty for our ashes. He gives us, he gives us joy for our mourning. And there's this exchange that happens when we bring ourselves, good, bad, and ugly, we bring ourselves unto the Lord. That is an act of worship. That is an act of worship. Bringing yourselves before the Lord. And you may say, Pastor, you don't understand. God would never want to see me. But Hebrews says a different story. And it says, if you are in Christ Jesus, you can come boldly before the throne of grace. You come boldly before the throne of grace. My kids, my kids can come boldly before my throne if I only had one at my house, which we should probably work on, all right? <laughs> I've just, I just had that thought. I need a throne at my house. Um, but my kids can come to me at any time. They can come bloody. They can come messy. They can come stinky. They can come looking great. That's less often, all right? <laughs> just being honest. Um, they can come boldly before my, uh, boldly between, our, our four-year-old, when she walks into the room, you know, it's, it's, she'll, come into, she'll come into our bedroom and she doesn't like politely open the door and then close it behind her. She opens it like the Kool-Aid man breaking through the wall, just boom, you know, <laughs> door goes flying. She's here, she's coming boldly. She doesn't care what's going on. That is how the Lord invites us to come into his presence. <laughs> the Lord wants, wants to be with you, to come boldly before the throne of grace. And so we see, how do we, how do we say yes to the Lord? Number one, untie yourself to the, from the things that are holding you back. Number two, bring those things, bring those things before the Lord. And number three, number three is this, is if the Lord asks, it's a place of obedience. If the Lord asks for it, bring it. No questions asked. Because one of the questions I think that we ask ourselves is that, you know, this place of holiness in our own lives of saying, Lord, what is, what do you want? And the answer is God wants, on one hand, he wants everything. He wants your whole life. And on the other hand, he's going to ask for things. So are you going to choose to live open-handed before the Lord? And so if the Lord asks for it, bring it. That's a place of obedience. In, in, in the Old Testament, we see when Moses comes to Pharaoh, he says, hey, let my people go that they may worship me in the, in the desert. This is uh, Exodus chapter three, four, five, right, right in there. There's a couple different times where Moses comes to Pharaoh and says, let my people go. Why? So that they come and worship me. That word worship in Hebrew means to serve. That they're, they're saying, I'm coming to worship, but really what that means is I'm coming to serve you. It's why when we gather together, it's called a service. It's not a worship experience. It's a, it's a, it's a service. We are coming to serve the Lord coming to serve, serve the Lord in our, in our worship, in our, in, our, in our prayers, in our study of scripture, in our fellowship together, in our gathering together. All of that is worship. All of that is service unto the Lord. So if the Lord is asking for something, bring it. That's how we say yes to the Lord. Untie yourself from, from the past. Number two, number two, bring it to him and bring what he asks. 
Those, those three things. So that's the first aspect of worship that we see is that we say yes to the Lord. The second, the second aspect of worship that we see, and Landon, if you could put that point up, is that we lay it down. And we talked about that during, during worship. We lay our crowns down before the Lord. We see this, this beautiful picture as Jesus begins to ride in on, 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 on a colt, on a donkey. And you may ask the question, why did he ride in a, on a donkey? There's so many better animals than a donkey. All right, you could have had this beautiful horse or, you know, he could have picked an elephant because there's lots of those in the Holy Land. Come with us in this fall and you'll see all the elephants of Jerusalem. Um, do you think that's true? You're going to be disappointed. Um, and so you, he, could have, he could have ridden in on, it, on anything. But the reality is this, is that there was a prophecy in the book of Zechariah that he's coming in on a donkey. Why? Why? A ruler that is riding in on a donkey is a ruler that is coming in peace. He's not coming to make war. And we see that Jesus, who is the Prince of Peace, is riding into Jerusalem, the city of peace, to bring peace to our soul through his own sacrifice. He is coming as, as, as the Prince of Peace, riding into Jerusalem. He's, he's coming in, and we are laying down our worship. Worship is laying down ourselves before the Lord, laying down our crowns. It's, it's, we, we talked about it during, during worship. Really, the, 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 the time that we had in prayer uh, uh, at the conclusion of worship today really is this point of laying our lives down. And we see in the same way that people lay down their, their coats before the Lord, we see in the book of Revelation that we're laying down our crowns before the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords. Why? He's the only one who's worthy. He is the only one who is worthy. And it's, it's so uh, powerful to me that we see in, 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 in Revelation chapter 5, I'm just... In Revelation chapter 5, we recognize that Jesus is the King of Kings. And John, who, is, who writes uh, the book of Revelation, he writes this as he's having this vision of heaven. And the question came out, of like, who, is worthy to, who is worthy to pay the price? Who is worthy to open the scroll? Who is, wor who is the one that was worthy? And they looked around and they found no one. And John said this, verse, verse 4, uh, Revelation 5 verse 4, So I wept much. Because no one was found worthy. Because no one was found worthy. And I, th that passage struck my heart uh, uh, this morning as I was reading it. That there's places in our lives where we look at the reality of our situation. And we say, Lord, can anyone fix what is going on? Is, can anyone, and what, whatever that is, fix Fix what's going on in my marriage. Fix what's going on in, with my kids. Fix what's going on in my finances. Fix what's going on in our nation. Fix what's going on. You fill in the blank. We all, we all face the reality of looking at things honestly and saying, God, I don't know what the solution is. And like John, he looked around and he found no one was worthy. And if we are looking for our solution from, from the, the, the people in this room, from the, the people in government, from the people, if we're looking for our solution on earth, no one will be found worthy. And there's this place of desperation. There's this place of mourning. There's this place where you see people become hopeless because there is no hope. We look around and you, you see in our culture the, the, the rates of suicide are skyrocketing. The rates of addiction are skyrocketing. The rates of alcohol uh, sales, the, the, the rates of, of drug abuse skyrocketing compared to 10, 15 years, 15 years ago. This is, this is statistical reality. Why? Because we look around and we say there's no hope for what is going on. There's no hope. And John looks around and he says, there is no one who is worthy to take care of what's going on. There's no one who is worthy. And as John is weeping and he is in this place, one of the elders, this is verse 5, Revelation 5.5, 5, but one of the elders said to me, do not weep. Behold, the lion of the tribe of Judah, the root of David, he has prevailed. He has prevailed. That the reality of our worship is we come to the one, the only one who is worthy, the only one who has prevailed, the only one who is victorious over the realities that we face. 
And so when we come to a place of worship, we're saying, Lord, I'm not able to take care of what's happening in the world around me. And I look around and no one else is. There's not an answer. But I look my eye, to, I place my eyes to the heavens. You are the one who is worthy. You are the one, the lion of the tribe of Judah. He is the one who has overcome. He is the one who has prevailed. And so as we come to this place, we're laying our lives down in worship and we're laying our lives down in worship because we recognize that there is nothing else that is worthy to handle the situations that we are going through. And so that, and that, that leads us to the third. Worship team, come on up. The third aspect of worship is we see this place, uh, uh, Landon, if you could put the point up, we see this place where we lift our voice. We lift our voice. We lift our voice, and as they, he rode into Jerusalem, we see Hosanna, Hosanna in the highest. What does Hosanna mean? Hosanna, is, it means save us. Save us. Save us. Save us now. Save us now. It comes out of Psalms chapter 118. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Save us, Hosanna. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Each of the Gospels, each of the four writers of the Gospels record this happening. Hosanna, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. It's found out of the Psalms. It's one of the songs that they would sing. It was Psalms 118 was the song that they sang at the dedication of the second temple. When they came back from captivity, this is Ezra and Nehemiah. They sang this song, Psalms 118, when they dedicated the second temple. The, Interestingly, at the first temple, they sang, they sang a, a, a portion of this song. He is good and his mercy endures forever. The, the, when Solomon built that first temple, that place where there would be worship unto the living God, the God that we serve, the song that was sung is he is good and his mercy endures forever. And that is true. That is true to us today. It's as true as it was the day it was sung in the days of Solomon. The second temple, when it was built, they sang, the first part of Psalm 118 is, he is good and his mercy endures forever. Let everyone say it. He is good and his mercy endures forever. The second part is save us. Save us. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. And the people, the people of Israel sang that song around that temple, prophesying of the day that we read about right here, where he, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord, is riding into the city to that same temple that was built. And Jesus here is fulfilling the prophecy. He's fulfilling it in, in, in living color. He's coming. He is good. His mercy endures forever. He's not coming in on this giant war horse. He's coming in peace. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Save us. Save us now. Save us now. That's the, that's the shout what is happening. It's that same word. It's that same idea that when the children of Israel were crying out to God in, in the book of Exodus, it says their cries reached heaven and he sent a deliverer. And the reality of our own situation is that we look at the reality of our life and we say, the only thing that can come from my lips is say, Lord, save us now. And the Lord hears from heaven and he sends his deliverance. And that deliverer's name is Jesus. And the day that he steps into the temple of your, the city of your heart is the day that you are set free to. And the story and the reality of Palm Sunday is that God wants to come, not as just as a conquering king. He wants to come as the lamb who was slain from the foundation of the world and the lamb that was slain for your sins and for mine, that we can live in that place of redemption and we can live in that place of peace with God. Luke says it this way, and you may have caught this when we, re we read through it. In the book of Luke is, is the one, Luke records the, the coming of Christ that we would read at Christmas uh, most, he's the one that's most specific about it. And he says in this passage in Luke, like, uh, Luke 19, he says, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord, peace in heaven and glory in the highest. Well, glory in the highest. You go back to Luke chapter 2 when the angels come. And, the, and Luke writes, he says, the angels come and he says, peace on earth, goodwill to men, glory in the highest. God has come to earth 
He's come to earth in the form of a baby. And now Luke is saying 30, 30 years later, he's come as a man and he's come as a king. He's come as a lamb that will be slain. And our response is saying, Lord, will I receive, will I receive your gift? Will I receive your gift? John is the one who writes that says, Hosanna, Hosanna in the highest. He is the king. He is the king. It is John who would write, who would weep within his own soul, says there's no one worthy until his eyes looked to Jesus. So we come to this week. God wants our eyes to fix on him. He is the only one who is worthy, the only one who is able to take the mess of what, we, of what is around us and be the solution in the midst of it. The cry of our heart is Hosanna. Lord, save us. Save us now. Save us now. And we, we cry Hosanna and we say, Lord, let, I'm giving everything to you. It's all at your feet. It's all yours. It's all yours. I can't, I can't fix this mess, but you can. The psalmist would write, I look, I, I, I lift my eyes to the heavens. Where comes my help? My help doesn't come from the hills. My do help doesn't come from my neighbors. My help comes from heaven. And I lift my eyes there. We fix our eyes on Jesus, the author and the finisher of our faith. Let's pray. Dear Holy Father, Lord, this morning as we come, Lord, we just purpose in our hearts, Lord, that you are a rebuilder. Lord, that you are, you are king of kings and you come to be king of our hearts, king of our lives. And Lord, to receive that means that we come in a place of worship and a place of surrender. And so, Lord, we do that this morning. I just want to give a moment for just the Lord to speak to your own heart in terms of the application that you would have from today's message. What are the things that you need to bring to the Lord? What are the things that need to be laid down? Where are the places that you need to untie yourself from things that are holding you back? What are the things that you need to come and bring to the Lord? Where's the places that you need to allow his kingship? Where are the places that, that there's hopelessness and you need to allow your eyes to be fixed on him? Because he is the lion of the tribe of Judah and he is the one who is worthy. I'm just gonna give you a couple minutes and the worship team's gonna lead us into a song. But what is it? The message today requires, the message today demands a response from us. It demands that we take action on the areas that the Lord's calling us to. So I'm gonna, Lord, I just pray by your spirit that you would open up our hearts today, open up our ears, that your spirit would bear witness and bear witness and speak to us on the places of application in our own life.
Lord, you are the only one who is worthy. You're the only one who is worthy of our praise. You're the only one who is worthy to fix the areas of our life that are broken down. And so, Lord, because of that, we open up the gates of our heart and we would say, Lord, may the King of glory enter in. Lord, this Palm Sunday, we say yes to you. We untie ourselves from the past and we bring everything to you. You are the one who is worthy. And we lay, them at your, we lay it at your feet. We lay our pride at your feet. We lay our brokenness at our, your feet. We lay our gifts, our talents, our treasure. We lay it all at your feet. And we would say, Lord, come. Lord, come. May the King of glory come in. I'm going to invite the prayer team to come down front. This morning, you may say, Pastor, there's some places where I would like to, res I'd like to pray with somebody about some things that are going on. We would love to partner with you, to partner with you to help you take those steps forward in your walk with the Lord. During worship, we talked about, we talked about bowing our knee and opening up our heart to the love of Jesus Christ. And if you remember, we prayed a prayer. We prayed a prayer. Of, of opening up our hearts to the love of Jesus Christ. If you prayed that prayer for the first time, then I'm going to invite, as we dismiss, I'm going to invite you to come down front and talk with, with two of our elders here at the church, Dan and Marlene. Dan, if you want to just raise your hand. They want to help you take the next step in your walk, in your relationship with the Lord. Here's the reality of our relationship with God. It's not meant to be walked alone. It's walked in community. And if today was a new beginning for you, then we want to help you take that next step in that new beginning. We want to, we want to walk with you. No one, does, no one does life as a lone wolf with Jesus. We do it as a community. It's what a, it's what a church is. So as we dismiss here in one minute, I'm going to invite you. If, that, if this, today was a day of new beginnings, today is a day of salvation to you, why don't you come down and, and talk with, with uh, Dan and Marlene. They want to help you take that step. Amen. Let's stand together. Lord, as we leave this place, we recognize that you're doing something in, in our spirit. And Lord, I pray, Lord, that as we open up to the, the realities of a, a God of new beginnings, Lord, we lay hold of your word that says you are the one that makes all things new. And Lord, that new beginning begins because we say yes to you. Lord, today we say yes to you. We say yes to your work. We say yes to your spirit. We say yes to your way. Help us walk that out in our everyday life. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. We will see you Friday night right here. If you want to receive prayer for anything, come on down front. We'd love to pray with you. God bless.